right there. We're going to talk about the pathology report that I think most people here have had or seen at one time or another. I'm going to divide this presentation into five components, but these components are interrelated. So I'll try to point out as we go along something to remember because you're going to hear about it again and there'll be a quiz. Like the last, <laughs> last rose, we have to ask the questions, so that's why you don't sit in the last rows. I'm going to start out with some, a little bit of anatomy, just sort of give everybody, make sure we're all in the same place on where the prostate is and kind of what it looks like. Uh, then I'm going to talk about how the tissue from the biopsy and the prostate are actually processed in order to make slides that we pathologists that we look at. Uh, then I'm going to talk about what we do with that tissue in order to prepare it for histology. Then we're finally going to get to the pathology report. We'll go through it section by section and explain what the little parts are that we pathologists look for and then put in the report. Finally, what do we do with all that information? Or what does the urologist or oncologist uh, do with that information? In terms of sort of creating a, uh, a stage and sort of putting them in a category. So let's start with a little bit of anatomy. Uh, the prostate is located deep inside the pelvis. So we have the pubic bone right here, which is a bone low down, which you can feel in front of you. Um, and it is uh, the, the bladder, the urinary bladder is on top of the prostate. Here we see the prostate here, and the rectum is uh, behind the prostate. You can see how close the rectum is to the prostate, and that's why we biopsy from that point, because Every other direction in there is going through a lot more and a lot more distant. It also in the, uh, sort of shows you why it's a, diff a difficult surgery to remove the prostate because it's really pretty hard to see down past all of these other organs. The other point is the urethra, which uh, carries the urine from the bladder uh, out the penis, passes through the prostate. And then there are also two vast deferents, one for each testicle that sort of migrate up, uh, wander around, and then actually enter the back of the prostate next to the seminal vesicle. The seminal vesicle are two sacs that are the back part of the prostate, and you can see back part of the uh, bladder. So that's kind of an orientation of where the prostate is and little parts that kind of enter, and I mentioned that because when we look at some of the actual tissue that we look at and examine, we'll be seeing some of these parts so you can get an idea of what it looks like and, and what it is we're trying to do with them. This is just another sort of close-up view of, of the anatomy. It doesn't really maybe add too much. Uh, again, the prostate right here underneath the bladder, right in front of the rectum, where we can get a biopsy needle through there. Uh, so next step. Now we've got some tissue that's come to the laboratory. And the first step is logging in the specimen. That means uh, making sure we have the proper identification of where the tissue can be, who the patient is, uh, their, their uh, specific number that's associated with them. All of these things are recorded and, uh, and, and also attached to, say, the container, uh, which is filled with formalin, uh, which is a solution of formaldehyde, and it preserves the tissue uh, for later on. The uh, specimen is accompanied by uh, a slip that has identifying material on it, so we have all of these sort of coordinated identifications to, make, to track things. So this is what happens here. You can see there are a lot of different tissues coming in here, not just prostates. Uh, it's, uh, it's the beginning point in the laboratory. The next step then is once all of the identifiers and the records are made so that we know um, who this belongs to and exactly what the issues are, it passes on to this, uh, oops, sorry, passes on to the uh, grossing station or macroscopic exam station. And the person here Sometimes called the prosector, pathologist assistant, pathologist, examines the tissue in its macroscopic state. So we'll see some examples of that in a moment, but something to remember, this is where that, that process takes place. 
And so the TCU is measured and weighed, uh, and then if it's if it's a fairly large size, it's uh, sectioned into uh, thin portions, which are then sort of subdivided and, uh, and, and placed in a little container called a cassette. And again, we'll get to that. But the cassette just takes a sample of the tissue, and we identify where that tissue is coming from. We'll see examples of this, but this is the idea. Here's the point where that process starts. Once the tissue, the samples of tissue, are placed in these little cassettes, they're uh, processed in what's called a tissue processor. And this processor has 12 fluid containers. Some of them are the same fluids, but uh, just fresh. And these processors operate for about an eight hour period, exchanging fluids uh, in the chamber, which is right here, which contains all of those tissue sample uh, cassettes or containers. And this processing uh, is necessary to prepare the tissue for the next phase, which is uh, creating a slide. These people are called histologists, uh, and they use microtomes, which we see right here, which contain a very sharp, uh, razor sharp or even sharper uh, blade on it that uh, takes a very, very thin slice out of that tissue sample that we had before, uh, and, is, and from that little thin slice is placed on a glass slide. The glass slide then is taken to another instrument uh, where it is, runs through several, uh, again, fluids, chemicals, uh, primarily to stain the tissue. And classically, the most common stains that we use are called hematoxylin and eosin, or HB for short. So you may see that in the report. That's what it's referring to. The hematoxylin is blue and stains the nuclei primarily blue, and the eosin is pink or red and stains all the rest of the tissue. So you can kind of get this organized structure and we'll see what that's about. So once the slides are prepared, um, they're taken from here and they're stayed, and then they are given to the pathologist. Uh, here's two actually pathologists examining the same slide under the microscope here. You can see this microscope has two uh, headsets to it so that the uh, pathologist can examine the same slide, look at the same things, and talk about the slide if they need to. Oftentimes you only need one pathologist, but if you have a problem case and you'd like to get someone else to comment, they can come in and look at it as well. So the pathologist has examined the slide here and looked for various characteristics. And we'll come to those when we get to the report. But they dictate those um, characteristics that they identify into a report which creates the pathology uh, report. Once they're done with the slides, the slides are retained in these drawers, which actually contain several hundred slides. Each slide has been labeled and named so you know where it belongs and where it came from. And they're all in order, so you can go back and find them again if you need to look for them. But they're retained. They're not gone. They're not discarded. So that's the process of getting from the tissue to a slide and a report. <clears throat> so now, let's talk about the tissue. We'll start with the biopsy process, since that's where we start. <coughs> our diagnosis. And this is the cassette that I'm referring to. And so there are four cassettes in a row here and another four down here. <coughs> and these little cords of tissue are actually biopsies. The biopsy uh, instrument is a slightly thick needle which has a, um, sort of a hole in it and it enters the prostate and then retracts from the prostate and takes a small thin or a small cylinder of tissue, which is what you see right here. Um, this is a scale for measuring it, and this is in centimeters, which is what we typically measure in rather than inches. But this corresponds to about an inch width here and about an inch and a half, two inches in length. So you can see these are not long, large pieces of tissue. Um, and there may be about uh, a couple millimeters in diameter, which corresponds to about an eighth of an inch or a sixteenth of an inch 
diameter. And this is a little pencil eraser to give, give you some sort of idea, estimate of the size. So this is a closer up view of the same thing again. The biopsy cylinder here and pencil eraser and a little measuring skill. So that's what the biopsies look like. That's the cassette they go into uh, and then they go through that processing machine. Now, <clears throat> when we're talking about a whole prostate, uh, a radical prostatectomy, this is an example of a prostate. We have the seminal vesicles sitting actually, one's over here, kind of folded over, and then the vas deferens right here. So recall, the vas deferens are coming from the testicles and entering next to the seminal vesicle. And this is looking from the back side of the prostate. The bladder sits up here, kind of where this roughened area is. And uh, in the next picture, a little bit fuzzy, but uh, this is uh, sort of turned over. So here we have a little, what we refer to as the apex of the prostate. This is where the urethra, which started up in here, passes out to continue on into the penis. So you have urine flowing through the uh, prostate. Now, when the prostate, the large uh, prostate, is brought to the uh, department, and the prosector is looking at it, they're only going to sample parts of the prostate. You can't look at the whole thing. It's just too much. Uh, so they, they uh, first put ink over the surface so that you know when you have your little sample portion on your slide, one edge of it is going to have ink on it. And you can see that ink. Uh, you'll know that is the edge of the prostate. And that's important because if there's tumor right there at the edge, it means there may be tumor that was left in the patient. So we need to know where the edges are. So we ink, in this case, the anterior is inked black, and the posterior is inked red. And then we ink the sides, uh, left and right, uh, different colors also. And here you can see, it's got a blue-green color here. Now, this is just sort of an aside, the comment, because not all prostatectomies are for cancer. Sometimes a patient, and, and this is characteristic just as we all age, the prostate expands and enlarges, and sometimes it can enlarge very dramatically. And so you have what's called benign prostatic hyperplasia or hypertrophy. And here, there's quite a large area of expansion. This is a benign process but it's still a problem for the patient because you see it's squashing the urethra. So the patient's not able to urinate because this big nodule is squishing it. So the treatment was to remove at least that part of the prostate. So now going back to our original prostate discussion. It's been serially sectioned, as I mentioned, and they're kept in order so you know this is starting at the apex and ending up at the, uh, the bladder um, portion. Uh, and you can see the, the, what the prostate looks like. The cross section is kind of shiny here, bulges a little bit there. That's actually more of that benign nodular proliferation I talked about. Cancer is, is firmer, and it, when you cut across it, it's, it stays flat. It doesn't, isn't so shiny. So if you actually look carefully, you can see there's a little yellowish region here and a little yellowish kind of semi-lunar section or portion here. That's the cancer in this particular specimen. And here's a closer up view of, of one of those sections and you can see that's where the cancer is. Now there may be other areas where the cancer is, you can't really appreciate it, but that's kind of what it looks like, so it's not exactly a dramatic thing to see. Now, so that's, that's the, the prosector's part of the macroscopic exam, examination, getting the tissue divided up, taking samples from all these different parts, and especially focusing on areas where we're suspicious that we see something that looks like a cancer. So the next step, after doing all that processing and the pathologist gets the slide, this is what they're looking at. Well, first of all, oops. First of all, uh, this is what a normal prostate looks like. What it is, 
is a collection of glands. Glands are these rounded areas, and if this were in three dimensional, these are like little cluster of grapes. And that's big as grapes, but with the same kind of idea. And uh, they have a central, what we refer to as lumen or space, and they're lined by an epithelium or a cell, a specialized cell for the prostate, and the cells secrete fluids that go into this lumen and then conduct on up into the area where the urethra is, and it gets combined with uh, the uh, semen, so it can conduct that out. Uh, so that's the, the sort of what these uh, cells and the glands in particular are doing. Then they're supported, in other words, they're held in place by this background of pink, what we refer to as stromal tissue, which is a combination of fibrous tissue and smooth muscle. <clears throat> it's these cells that line the glands that cause almost all cases of prostate cancer. There's some rare types of cancer of this, but it, they're rare. So what happens when the cells become cancerous? They are not as good at forming those glands. And the earliest changes, uh, they still have reasonable ability to form glands, sort of like what they're showing in this diagram. So they're all kind of a similar size gland, usually smaller though than the normal gland, uh, and kind of packed in. As the cell becomes less and less able to form glands, what we call more poorly differentiated, this is a well differentiated part, and then this is a poorly differentiated, it goes through these various changes or stages of how well it forms glands. So then now the glands are becoming a little more irregular and kind of separated, and then down here you can see some crossing over of cell growth sort of piling up inside instead of being nice and uniform. Then down here it becomes even more and more poorly formed uh, with just a few little lumen, just kind of uh, collections of cells. And then finally, in the most poorly differentiated, it's basically just solid sheets of cells or individual cells. You'll see there's a number right next to each of these sort of categories, one through five. <clears throat> Those numbers come from Dr. Gleason in the 70s was looking at these kinds of different cells and said, I think we can make it. it was trying to form a system for describing these cells. And it gave each one, uh, depending on the degree of differentiation, one of these numbers. So it's the Gleason grading system. Now what you do, and we'll come to this when we get the report, is when you get a Gleason score, you actually take the tumor that you see and you pick the area that's most of the type that you see. So if you see mostly a two, then you give a two. Then you look and you say, what's the next most common area? And the next most common area might be a three. So you go two plus three, and you come up with five. So the Gleason score is the, is the combination of those two numbers. And so the lowest Gleason score you could have would be a one and a one. In other words, everything is a one. So the most common and the second most common is a one. And so one plus one is two. The highest Gleason score would be a five plus five or ten. Now on the side here, we have three samples of that thing that I said, H and E stained slides. Hematoxyl and eosin or H and E. And here's a grade three, so we don't have examples of grades one or two, but we have the grade three, and we see some irregularity in the glands, but you can still see spaces in here, uh, so that they're forming something that you could call a gland with a little lumen in it. And you go down to four, and there, you still can see some, but there are also some areas where you just don't get very good gland formation at all. You don't see really a lumen, you just see sort of cells packed in there. And then finally, when you get to grade five, it's just like a homogeneous blob of cells. So that's, that's a big part of what we're looking for uh, as pathologists. We see the cancer, then can we grade the cancer according to the cells? So now let's get on to the actual pathology report. We're going to start with a biopsy report. 
Let me just kind of go to the next. Since, since the examination of the specimen starts with the gross or macroscopic examination, the prosector dictates um, what they see at the time they're examining the specimen. So here you can see, we're keeping it in order, there were six different biopsies obtained, and it was labeled left base, so there was a biopsy from the left base of the prostate, uh, and, it was and it consisted of three of those cylinders, and each one was measured, uh, and then it was said to be put in one cassette. So that's kind of the description of what we got, and keeping track of it. Now if we go back, the pathologist now looks at the case and looks for certain features to describe and diagnose. So again, going to that first specimen number one, keeping track and order of everything, we have prostate from the left base, and it was a needle core biopsy, and carcinoma was found. Now, prostate cancer is called adenocarcinoma. Adenocarcinoma is a glandular type of carcinoma. There are a lot of other type of cancers from different sites. There are also glandular carcinomas that are called <coughs> adenocarcinoma. So they need to specify prostate adenocarcinoma. I mean, we wouldn't know that because it's from the prostate, but still, it's good to put it in there. So here's this Gleason score that I mentioned. So 3 plus 3 equals 6. So it looks like the whole thing, everything you see is a group of grade 3. So the dominant component's a 3, and then whatever you want to call a secondary component's a 3 also. And then we estimate how much of those biopsy specimens are contained in cancer. So it's estimated that half or 50% of all of the little cylinder biopsies contain cancer in it. Then the next thing is we look for perineural invasion. Perineural invasion is, is a, something where the, there's little nerves in the a prostate. Now you don't always get a nerve, so you don't, can't always look for it. But if it's there, you look and see if there's some perineural invasion. And the reason is, is because uh, it indicates a, a, a higher chance that the, that the uh, tumor is migrating outside of the prostate. So it alerts the urologist that this may be a probable case in terms of trying to get all of the tumor out. The second thing is that we look for what's called lymphovascular invasion. So there are little vessels inside our entire body that go either to the lymph nodes or they go or the blood vessels. And so you want to see if the tumor has gone inside those things. Because if it does, that also increases the chance that you're going to find it spread somewhere. So it's alerting the urologist or oncologist to these possibilities. It's not saying it's happened, because we don't know that until we have more to look at, but it's, it's a higher possibility. So the same thing is applied to each one of these, and some of the areas are just benign, so you don't have to say anything else because it's all benign, and that's all that really counts. But in other areas, we saw to see the same thing here. Here is 3 plus 4, so the tumor is a little less differentiated part of it here. So that's the biopsy report that goes to the urologist or oncologist and, and uh, decisions are made on what to do next based on this information. So if the decision is to have a, a resection, usually a complete prostate resection, then we get the prostate. And you saw what that looked like, what we did. And let me go on, start with the gross macroscopic uh, description. You can see it's much more detailed than the biopsies, because the biopsies were just little cylinders. There wasn't a whole lot to say about them. But here, there is more to say. And so it's weighed, and that it's measured in three different dimensions. Um, and then the seminal vesicles are identified and measured. Uh, and then it talks about inking the various surfaces. So here, the right lobe is uh, black ink, remainder of the left lobe, the blue ink, posterior is orange, etc., etc. So we can go back and go, okay, I see some tumor close to this edge, this color. So it belongs to that uh, part of the prostate. And then you can see down here again, we keep track of where those samples are taken. So we've taken a, a number of samples here, 
So a sample from the right lobe is the medial apex, the lateral apex, and etc. etc. So we're really keeping track of where things are so we're not going, oh, I wonder where this is, looks like a problem. So now the pathologist again has the slides, checks them out, looking for, again, cancers of primary interest here. So we have again adenocarcinoma, oh, we first state what we have, which is the prostate with seminal vesicles and what was going on. Adenocarcinoma, this is by the way not the same patient who had the biopsy, it's two separate reports. Um, so in this case we have a 4 plus 4 equals 8, so we have a, a, a less well differentiated or more poorly differentiated tumor. And you notice there's this note about tertiary pattern. If there's a third pattern that's really not very prominent, but at least 5%, then we call that a tertiary pattern and we pop that in there. It doesn't really affect the staging later on, but it's kind of an indicator that maybe this tumor is getting a little more advanced, so it's kind of a little bit of a, if you're dancing on which way to go on something, this might lead you one way or the other. But anyway, that's what the tertiary pattern is. Something that's just a little bit extra than the primary dominant parts um, and at least 5%. And, and then we note whether it's in one or both lobes, and we'll see why that's significant when we talk about how we aggregate that information. So the tumor involves, in this case, again, an estimate of how much of the prostate is involved. Uh, then the next thing is to look, is there any tumor um, outside the prostate? Prostate has a capsule of fibrous tissue around it. And, the, um, and, and if the tumor goes through that uh, fibrous tissue, then we call that extra prostatic extension, which means that it's showing a little bit more aggressive behavior. It doesn't necessarily mean the tumor was left behind, it just means it's outside of that little capsule that you <coughs> show. Um, seminal, seminal vesicles to know whether it's in the seminal vesicles, and we'll see what that's about in a minute. Then the margins. So in this case, the margins are uninvolved. That means we see no tumor outside of where the surgery was done, meaning all of the inked edges had no tumor at the edges. Now, because we can't look at everything, we can't say for sure it's all clear, but we have a pretty good idea of it. Um, perineural invasion. <coughs> Here it's not so critical because it's really telling you whether the tumor might extend beyond the prostate capsule. We see it does, so it kind of corresponds to that finding. Uh, then again, is it in any of those lymph node vessels or blood vessels? So this second part here is just a restatement of all of this in kind of an outline form. These reports typically go to uh, a department in the hospital or wherever. Uh, called the tumor registry. So the tumor registry tracks, keeps track of all the various cancers that have been uh, identified in the hospital and or treated there. So they use this part of the report because it's easier for them to get the information out so they can put it in their database. So you see sort of a doubling up of the same information. Okay, so now we've got the uh, pathology report with all of this information in it. And we want to put people, sort of put people in a category. Nobody's, everybody's unique. So it's just kind of a, getting an idea of where do we go. We have so many choices we can work with. And it's not like we can have a very specific one for each person. So we try to kind of get people in the same groups. So there's a staging process here. Staging, um, I guess I cut it off a little bit here, but, um, there's, it's it's uh, called the TNM system. A T is for the tumor, N is for lymph nodes, and M is for metastatic. So there's three parts to it, and they each have a number, uh, which ranges from one or zero, actually, to four. A zero means we don't find any tumor. So that's the best one. But uh, one means that basically the tumor is just, is, is only found under the microscope. And I'm not going to go through each of these, only to say that 
There's some subdivisions of each of these. Most tumors actually fit into this category of T2, um, but a certain number, not insignificant, uh, fit into T3, and this is where the tumor has gotten outside of the capsule, typically, or it's in the seminal vesicles. And then finally, T4 is where it's really outside. The lymph nodes means if, if it's spread to a lymph node that's in the pelvis, and then metastasis means if it's spread to lymph nodes away from the pelvis or into the bones or into other organs. So there's these different categories or different components. And this is basically a little bit better statement of all of that, just kind of written out, but sometimes the diagrams are easier to understand. And so finally, we can group people in terms of how much problem they're going to have with the prostate cancer by putting them in these group stages. So you can see it's not just one of those things that we looked at before, but it's actually a collection of possibilities. You could have this possibility of a T1 or T2A in any PSA and any Gleason score, and you're going to fit into group one, which is going to have the best outcome, the best sort of changes in there, you know, the impact of the prostate cancer. And then the group stage four, where you have the very extensive um, problematic ones. So we have ones with metastasis uh, or lots of tumor extending outside of the prostate. These groupings are really actually more of helpful in epidemiologic type studies or when you're trying to set up a clinical trial. Because you need to sort of focus what you're trying to answer in a clinical trial, and you can't answer it for everybody at once. So, and, and typically these are the people who you're trying to deal with clinical trials, because these people generally will do really well. So, so you can set up your study plan by saying, I want group four stage patients, and then that means we'll be looking for people who fit these categories in here, and then creating a, um, a clinical study. But when you're actually dealing with a decision about an individual, you're really looking more at these independently, you know, what are, how do these all fit together and how do you want to go forward. But I didn't really come here to talk about that because I'm not really an expert in the clinical approach. I'm just trying to give you a sense of the utility of some of this staging versus this staging. So that brings me to the conclusion of this presentation and uh, hopefully um, a better understanding of your own reports. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Let me talk. Can I have my mic back? Yeah. Test check. There you go. Let me tell you how I like to uh, handle questions here, because I'm sure that there's some questions on what this biopsy means to you and how you can use this biopsy to determine your course of action. So what I'd like to do so I'd like to have anybody who has any questions, come on up here, line up here, so that we can get your question on the mic. Because if you ask questions from the audience, most of the people are not going to be able to hear you. So I'm going to pass the mic to you, have you address uh, the question to Dr. Heinz, and he will give you the most perfect answer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, Doctor, I sure appreciate... Uh... Oh. There we go. We would very much appreciate, after many years, uh, a few curiosities I have to be satisfied. Uh, is it possible that perineural invasion could be seen initially, but then when a cut is passed to a facility that's going to actually do the work, they do another, um, bio, or another uh, pathology report and don't find perineural invasion? Uh, why would, could that be just that the cut that they passed didn't contain that material? Or? Uh, well, let me see if I can clarify what you're asking. So, you have a situation in which you had a biopsy, I don't know, would you or someone had biopsies, and the initial pathology report said perineural patient identified and present. Then you went somewhere, somewhere else to have a consultation on what to do, and their pathologist looked at it and they didn't mention it. Is that what you're saying? Something like that, except that the uh, initial uh, facility finds perineural invasion. 
uh, when the place that actually does the, um, the in my case, radiation, oh. uh, always asks for uh, for a slide so that they can uh, do, you know, have a second opinion before they do the work. They find the same thing, except do not find paranormal invasion. What would be interesting to me, uh, there's, there's a couple of possibilities here. Uh, it would be interesting to me. Did they say specifically, do not identify perineural, or they just don't talk about they, it? Specifically? Well, well, the place for a second opinion didn't talk about it. Okay. The place that did the work mentioned, do not find paranormal okay. invasion. Uh, so the first place? First yeah, place finds it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think I understand, but um, the, um, it's possible, depending on what's happening, if you look at this, it's the very same slide, then it would always be good to say, you know, what do you think that is right there? It, it is a very small, subtle finding, and it is possible to overlook it when you're looking at it. So that's one possibility. The other is, sometimes when you go for a consultation somewhere, Someone will, the, the original site will give a recut, meaning they'll make a new slide instead of the original slide. And when you go make a recut, you're actually getting a little bit different place on the original tissue. And it may be that it's not in that recut because it's gone to a, it's slightly deeper into the tissue. Because this, this really is a tiny little focus. It's not like it's occupying a a large portion of the biopsy, so it would be easy to move in and out of it. And that's why I emphasize that always, um, can you be sure that you've got everything or everything's there because you can't look at everything. So, so my questions would be uh, that I would have in these specific cases, were recuts done or was it the original? And what the issue was, why people didn't see it, would be have to look at it and go, I see it or I don't see it. I don't know what they were doing. Probably was recuts. And then, if, if I might just ask you one other thing. Um, if one place finds that 50% uh, is affected and another place finds that 80% is affected, is that just that they measured it a little more closely? And, and, and is it, if it's 80%, that doesn't mean it's 80% on a row. It, it means that maybe there's some here and then nothing, and then maybe up to the 80% is a little bit more. Is that, is that the way it is? Correct. So it, the, the prostate cancer it really can be multifocal or multiple sites and so you get little skips or it can be sort of curling around in the biopsy kind of just catches little parts of it. So if you're looking at the biopsy, actually what I would like to do when I uh, uh, reported it is I would actually say I measured the total amount as to be 0.5 millimeters or 5 millimeters and the whole biopsy measured one centimeter, 10 millimeters, so that's what I say, and that's 50%. So then you can see how much, what your whole thing is, and how much you're calling, but some people just give the percent. And so if you had a very tiny biopsy that was like three or four millimeters long, then you know, one millimeter, two millimeters, either way is a big difference in percent. So it could be related to that. The other part is, when you estimate the percent involvement of the prostate gland like was done there, that's really hard because you only have a little portion of it and all of the pieces are really irregular. So you sort of make these kind of very rough estimates of what the area is and they estimate how big it was and it really has a lot of variation and variability in, in it. And it's not, as you can see from the staging process, it's really not a crucial uh, factor. It's just sort of, is it all over the prostate or is it just one side? That's what kind of defines it more. It's, it's really interesting. Well, thank you very much, sir. Okay. <coughs> well, thank you for your presentation, Doctor. Uh, it seems that there was a change in the criteria for the Gleason score. Uh, and say somebody is diagnosed with a Gleason 3, you know, you don't see very many ones or twos nowadays. So, so my question is, if I'm diagnosed with a Gleason three, could it be a Gleason one or two? And if so, could you, could someone break it out? Say, for example, in my case, I'm on active surveillance, and there's a difference between, you know, low risk and low low risk. So, you know, 
I don't know if I'm asking the right question, but... Yeah, I think I hear what you're saying. So you just have biopsies. You haven't gone through a prostatectomy, so we're just talking about biopsies, right? Yes. And when you said Gleason 3, did they just go... Because did they give you a Gleason 1 plus 2 equals 3, or did they give No, no, 3 plus 3 equals 6. Oh, okay. That, that's, that's an important factor. So, so, actually there has been a refinement of what we appreciate with respect to these, um, this appearance of the Gleason score. Uh, I'd say it was somewhere around in the 90s. Um, the, the people who are studying this majorly, <laughs> Uh, and one of them is Dr. Epstein and Johns Hopkins, recognized that things that were classified as just simply the Gleason grade of a one or a two, I'm not talking one plus or anything, but just a one or a two, are so well differentiated, appear so normal, close to normal, that you can't identify them on a biopsy. And no pathologist should be making that statement that I see a one or a two on a biopsy, the best we can do is a three. By then, it has enough irregularity and changes that we can be confident of a three. But a one or a two really requires the whole prostate to see what the whole thing looks like. And one wonders what those, you know, whether we're, whether those are really cancer, that what their chance of going, doing anything besides just growing a little bit is because you don't really get a chance to study it. So it, it is a little bit kind of historical that we keep that one and the two in there, and it can be called on a complete prostatectomy, but not on a biopsy. So your three plus three is the lowest I think so that we can come up. If I'm, I'm going to make sure I understand what you're saying. If I have a three plus three, is that a three only? Or is it a one, oh, two, or a three? I see what you're saying. It, it means that it, everything looks like a three. So the dominant, you know, you say, oh, you know, most of it looks like a three, and if I'm going to take a little second part of it, well, that looks like a three, too. So it means it's all three, and everything looks like a three. It's not like there's a one and a two in there. It's all three. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, not thank you, but thank We're you. right. I got you. I got you. I totally understand. <laughs> My question kind of dovetails onto his. Um, I've been diagnosed with a six, and Dr. Epstein did it, Hopkins. And, oh, there you um, go. <laughs> but he disagreed with two other pathologists, of buddies of mine from St. Jude Hospital, who are very smart. So I think there's a kind of a, um, uh, a bias in the way people look at things. But my question is this, is that I had a high PSA, and my urologist kept on biopsying me. And I'm in the 39th biopsy. Oh my gosh. He found something, uh, a 39th needle. He found something wrong. And um, they looked at it and they called it a 6 or a 7. There's been some debate. But my question is like, I've seen things under the microscope that have been scarred by you know, previous surgeries. And they look to me like they're, like they're cancerous. I'm an ophthalmologist, so I see basal cell carcinomas, which look like, you know. Um, and they look weird, or I've seen chalazines that now look like basal cell carcinomas because they've been operated on. And my question is twofold. What's, what kind of certainty after numerous biopsies can you have that the disruption is not man-made as opposed to um, uh, a true cancer? Because when I saw them, it looked very scarred under the microscope. Um, well, that's an interesting question. But, um when we don't actually get information saying, I biopsied this person a whole slew of times, and so you might want to keep that in mind. Um, we, do, we do, though, if, if the biopsies are going to the same site, so the same place that I practice, then I will have a record when I'm actually looking at the biopsy that, oh, this patient has been previously biopsied, and I will look and see what, what has been happening and what's been called, and if I think there's anything that I know you know, is different to me, then I will get those previous ones out and I will look to see that it wasn't missed that time. Now, as to recurrent biopsies and the scarring, I'm not sure that I've seen anything like that, so I'm not sure I've seen someone who's had maybe as many biopsies, but if, if there is inflammation, meaning low inflammatory blood cells in there, especially acute inflammation, that can cause reactive changes. 
which can make it look worse than it is. And so you have to be really cautious in those conditions. But if there's not, then generally the cells, if they look malignant, that's because they are. Um, it's, it's, it, the scarring process doesn't really make them look worse. It is, it is interesting though, there are phenomena that occur that make, that complicate the pathologist's job sometimes we need Dr. Epstein that helps out. So in later stages of life, things can atrophy and that atrophic process can make the cells of the glands shrink down and make the cells look a little bit irregular on I mean, the glands. And then we begin to wonder, is this atrophy or is this cancer? And we may have to ask his help on it, but um, the scarring process I have one other, one other quick question. When I had this diagnosis, I did a medlar search, and to my shock, when I looked at biopsies of healthy people at different ages, they found prostate cancer in increasing numbers as people got older. And that kind of troubled me. How do you differentiate between a prostate cancer, which is going to be an issue, versus one that's not? By age 70, what was it, like 40% of people? 70, yeah, 70 percent. It's a huge percent. And so how do you come up with certainty as to whose prostates need to be plugged? If they were just like taking off a mole, big deal, but obviously this is a lot more complex. Actually, you feel on something that is highly controversial and you're probably aware of the recent USPTF statement saying we shouldn't be doing PSAs as a screen because we don't really know what's going to be a problem case and what's not a problem case. So it's, I'm just saying that as part of the controversy. But to go back, is my understanding actually, I'm not aware of anybody who's volunteered to have a whole bunch of biopsies done you know, a series of patients. So I think you're referring to the autopsy studies. Yeah, and, and it's interesting actually, I, I got out the major autopsy study that was, was referenced on that. And um, there's a typo in it. And actually, though, it's 40%, it's like you said, the 70% got in there, but when you actually look at their tables, it's 40%. <laughs> but it's still significant. I mean, it's, it's out there, and um, it's, it's, it's an issue. We, we, we don't know how to do it. And it's like we were talking a little earlier. We need some better molecular markers that we can and, and these things are actually sort of in the pipeline. I can't point to any, and I'm not sure anybody has any. But what I'm saying is the technology is evolving that we can actually start looking at the DNA a lot better, and maybe we will be able to pull out those cases and say, this is going to be aggressive, and this one isn't. Uh, but we aren't there yet. Um, and I'm not sure how close we are either. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I have two questions, but okay. I hope they're, they're really simple and straightforward. I'm doing something wrong. Um, on my B sample, on a recent biopsy, it says in here, Gleason grade four plus three for a total score of seven slash 10 involving two or three fragments. And I'm not sure I know what the seven slash 10 means. And the, second, the second part of my question is, uh, let me just read this comment. The largest focus of N Dino Carcinoma? Thank you. In specimen D has features suggestive of prostatic duct carcinoma, similar uh, areas in question in blocks E1 and F1 are suspicious of the same thing. So can you show me on your little thing up there what they mean by prostatic duct carcinoma, where that is, and uh, what that is, 7 slash 10 refers to? Okay, we'll start with the slope of 7 slash 10 first. So, um, again, there's the, you said I think it started at the 4, and then it was plus, plus 3. So the 4 meant there's more, I mean, since the 4 was the first number, it meant there's more of the 4 than there is of the 3 relative to each other. And then, what it, it's kind of a typical way we, do this partly because in other systems, other organs that you're uh, making uh, remarks about, doesn't have the same uh, scoring system, the same numbers. So we go slash 10, meaning this is a scoring system in which we go, in this case, 2 to 10. So it's just simply saying out of possible 10, there's a score of 7. Uh, and, and in some other sites, 
you, you just have scores from uh, one to three or one to four, and so you might go slash three slash four. So that's what that's referring to. Okay. The, the prostatic duct carcinoma. <clears throat> so people try to break down the prostate into uh, components of the way the glands are. So if you go, let's, let's go back one more. So we have the glands, these are the glands uh, itself. And the glands then have a lumen, which then leads into, we'll call it duct. So it carries the secretions from these glands down a little thin tube that comes together into more and more tubes until it's kind of a larger tube uh, carrying it. So the, the, there's some people who are trying to subclassify the tumor as being from these glands or from these ducts, but I'm not sure that it's really that evident. And certainly it's not part of a breakdown of how are these going to behave and what are we, how do we classify them in terms of the stage. So, so this person serves a lot. I'm really studying up on this, and I think I'm going to call it Dr. Corsino. <laughs> um, the, the oncologist I talked to said the, the oncologist, the oncologist yeah. that I, I talked to said that uh, like 95% of these do not involve uh, the ducks. And <coughs> so, uh, in looking at my 5%, there is less data and so forth. How all that performs and where it's gone to, and there's a possibility of going to the lymph. Something could have gone to the lymph glands. The, this, as I was saying, the trying to make this distinction is not easy. In fact, it's questionable. So some people may feel that they can make that distinction, and some can't. And if you look at a whole bunch of people looking at it, you get a different answer. So it's hard to study it because you're not really sure what you're looking at unless you have something that's more specific. So um, I would, what I would say is, I would, I would rely on the other information that you have, but I'm just telling you, I'm not your oncologist, I'm not your urologist, I'm not, not, not your oncologist. But to me, the tumor will do, it will sort of declare itself that I know you have to wait sometimes and not know what that's going to be. Um, but I don't think we can really predict that well based on whether it's duct or not duct. But we have some variants out there, especially some pathologists like to really subdivide. But then you can't do very good studies on it because you don't know, but you can't get everybody to agree on the subdivisions. So you can only sort of do some more channel of things. <laughs> I don't know if that helped or not, but what I'm trying to say is... Well, actually, which... actually, actually helped a whole bunch. Okay. <laughs> I understand the certainty and the same Yes, that's what we're talking about. Thank we're you. talking about some people who like to subdivide and some don't. <laughs> Thank you for your time. I'm recently a 4 plus 3 diagnosis, and I'm considering a color Doppler. Any comments you might want to make on that? You'd be considering the what? Color. Doppler, some doctor up in Ventura. <laughs> I'm not sure what that is. What he's talking about, Dr. Heinz, is going to see Dubon in Ventura to get a color Doppler reading uh, and possibly biopsy with the oh, color Oh, I see, I see. I thought it was procedure. <laughs> <laughs> you all didn't recognize my accent. <laughs> um, no, I don't have any comment. I, I understand. I think there's a very active group up in the area. Or maybe I'm thinking Marina Del Rey, I'm not sure. But I don't have any uh, real comment. Yeah, he's talking about uh, Dr. Schultz's office in Marina Del Rey, and Duke Vaughn does the color doctor in Ventura. Uh -huh. uh, Mark Schultz also, in his uh, operation, also does the color, color doctor in Marina Del Rey. Uh, so, just for that information. I think it is important, though, to you know, get as much information as what you're comfortable with. Sometimes, though, you can talk to a lot of different people and get so many different comments that you kind of, you know, we're shaking up this time And I do, like I said, understand what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, two quick uh, question, uh, questions, Dr. Heinz. Number one, um, when you have a radical prostatectomy, you're also removing a, a fair length of the urethra, and I'm just curious how 
that should be connected. Do they do that with an artificial tube, or do they just pull until <laughs> they meet? And uh, number two, um, uh, where do you think we are, as technologically speaking, to getting to the point where you could automatically scan and analyze biopsies the microscope? By computer. I think we're a significant distance from that. I think it's possible to see people coming out saying, I have something hot off the presses, and I have a way of determining these things. But I don't think, I don't think we're real close to something that we can really all sit here and be comfortable with. <laughs> to me, and this is sort of one of the upsides and one of the downsides of prostate cancer, because there's a good number, as we know, of prostate cancers which are very indolent and which will go on for a long time. So in order to do the study to find out whether this is going to be one of those or not, you have to wait a long time and, and you have to you know, operate your study carefully so that you don't have a lot of people changing what they do in the middle of it. Um, that's, that's kind of mostly what I can say. I, I know I've seen, for example, the PSA is, is questioned and brought up to doubt. And so there are people who brought out several different markers, but none of them have really panned out, or at least not long enough to see whether they are working out. And it's true for a lot of other tumors as well. There's a lot of activity, but it takes time and it takes actually expense to put together the appropriate studies. And a lot of people who are studying don't want to take that time and expense because they want to start marketing them now. Um, I couldn't give you any time frames on it, but there is that, quote, problem with prostate. Um, because it takes a while to find out what's, gonna, what's going to happen and have enough numbers to do it. Um, I hope you find some things. Yeah, excuse me. Uh, what do you do with this, this thing, uh, piece of urethra? Oh, the urethra. OK. <laughs> My understanding is that to the, the bladder and the Resected portion of urethra are brought together, but Dr. Weissman Weissman can answer that question better than I can. But when I asked that same question of my urologist, then those things back together, that was my understanding. Yeah, the, <laughs> Russ can tell you as well as me. Yeah, but that, you're absolutely right. Okay. Cool. There's enough flexibility in the tissue and things down there that you can bring them together. Yeah, that's one doctor to another. He looks at him and he says, "You're absolutely right, boy." Is that? <laughs> Let me tell you guys, though, that the one thing that they don't tell you too much, uh, these urologists and uh, people out there, that when you go through this operation, you're going to get a shorter penis. <laughs> now he's going to rebut. <laughs> no, actually, because that is a commonly believed thing, and many of us believe it, there have been some research studies that show if you immediately after surgery get started with potency programs, including the vacuum device, and do it faithfully for a year, they've actually studied it, and the shortening is minimalized dramatically by starting real early. And I, I didn't know that until recently there was a study published. So what he's saying, guys, is make sure you exercise the muscle to keep it where it's supposed to go. <laughs> operating a group 
we're still pretty much individual. We'll show some things to someone else if we're not sure, and we'll get an opinion from somebody else. But we don't actually take a whole bunch of them and say, hey, let's see how close we are to say what we see here. Do we, are we reproducible? And are we you know, precise and accurate about it? We, we, there isn't anything, and I don't know if anybody really does it. Maybe Dr. Epstein does it because he focuses on it, but the rest of his department doesn't do it because there's all these other possible ones we could work on. But it's a great question. It's a really good thing. <coughs> How many samples does one need to take in the biopsy that is dressing? Uh, one, one more time. How many samples does one need to take in the biopsy that different centers seem to do different numbers? Six samples and 12 samples? Uh, how many biopsies? How many samples in a biopsy? He says that doctors do different different numbers of samples. Uh, some doctors do six, some doctors do 10, some do 12. True. That's true. I, I, you know, I, you see, I think there's I don't have a good answer to that because I haven't looked studied up on it, but we see we see anywhere from six to twelve. Um, and it seems like six should really cover the bases on you. Um, it should be sufficient. But some people like to just get a few more extra along the length of each side of the prostate. Um, and I think there might be some information on that out there about you know results likelihood that you're gonna get a result, but I don't know it offhand, and again maybe Marty does, but but I don't know what right offhand, I just can't tell you. Well, I have heard it said that more samples are better. Statistically, you cover more of the, more of the uh, prostate by taking more samples. But I think the negative that is given, stated is that by you're allowing more chances of the cancer spreading outside of the biopsy. Okay, I didn't catch all of that again. That was the He's concerned about if you take too many samples, the cancer will actually spread outside the capsule oh. by the by the needle biopsy. No, nobody's ever demonstrated that. And that's that's really not the case. There, there are a lot of other needle type procedures done for other organs, and it's like it doesn't happen. It's not a problem. It, it won't spread that way. Okay, I have just a couple of additions. So you touched on. Uh, the discrepancies, a Charles question, the discrepancies between individuals. Uh, there might be differences of opinion, and so therefore that brings up the question of uh, how about second opinions? Should we get a second opinion, or are they going to rely pretty much the same? I don't, again, have statistics on that. It's, it's um, a great question. Um, if, uh, I would say that pretty much, you know, I mean, if, you, if you're going to a place that's got a good reputation in the community and everything, then the change, uh, the, the distinction between the different gradings, which is basically the primary issue, um, shouldn't be by, by more than one, one way or the other. So someone might go from an eight to a nine, and if we look at the staging, an eight and a nine, are fall into the same group. The real critical ones are six to seven, and seven to eight, nine, ten. Um, and I think if you have one and you're falling in there, and, and this, you're falling into one of those three zones, or well, if you're up in the upper end of the zone, I don't think it's going to change anything. But if you're a six or a seven, and you're like, well, I'd, I'd, I'd sure like to get somebody else to take a look at it. You can do either of two things. You can go, if the department where it was done has multiple pathologists, you can say, can you show it around and make sure everybody agrees? Now, of course, that presents the issue of, well, you know, do I want to disagree with my colleague or not? It's a little different. So, there's a confidence level there. Uh, in general, I think it should be good. Uh, I mean, it, you get a good response, because there's some people in there, and, and the question came back saying, it's really important for me to know whether this is a six or a seven. Then I think people will really take it seriously. I mean, I think we do anyway, but we really look hard and say, you know, I'm not sure, and then send it out to get another opinion. But if you really want another opinion from somebody else, it is not a problem to request that. And um, like I said, our typical consultant is Dr. Epstein at, at uh, Johns Hopkins. 
but there are others around. Uh, but it's always nice to be able to, you know, say who you want it to go to. Yeah, now would the patient uh, make that request directly uh, with his uh, urologist or oncologist? They, generally it goes to the urologist or oncologist. The, the urologist or oncologist should be supportive enough to say, sure, I'll call them up and say, my uh, Joe Blow wants to have it sent somewhere else. Can you have somebody else take a look at it? Okay, one hypothetical question. Let's say you choose, you have a, a Gleason 6 and choose active surveillance and you neglect to do your active surveillance and three or four years down the line you get a lease of nine or ten. Uh, I mean a PSA of nine or ten. You started out with a PSA of four, lease of six, and now you have a PSA of nine or ten. Is it conceivable that you may get now a Gleason of eight versus original Gleason six? I mean does it Gleason increase? Uh, over time that is one of the um, sort of difficulties with cancer generally. Their DNA is unstable, so that as they begin to proliferate the tumor cells, it may degenerate into a more poorly differentiated tumor. So it is possible. The lower the grade, the less, the more stable the DNA is, and so the slower that's likely to happen. But it can happen in yearly. I don't think anybody has any kinetic information on how quickly that can happen, especially because there are very many people in the past, now we have more people maybe opting for active surveillance, we'll, we'll get a better sense of that. But you really need to take a look at stuff like that because there's a tricky statistical problem that if you just sort of don't, aren't studying people tightly on it, then you, you can come up with an answer, but it might not be, might not be reliable. I think some people are studying it pretty tightly though because it's really a, it's really a concept to approach uh, as we try to identify tumors that are, that are fairly indolent and can be monitored rather than aggressively approached. So, but, but the answer to your question is they can transform. It is going to be a risky tank. But if you stay on top of it instead of waiting for four years. That was a hypothetical. <laughs> okay, one last question then I'll let you off the hook. I said in my introduction that your interests are in helping reform healthcare delivery by improving testing cho choices in healthcare. Could you elaborate on how you're doing that? Um, yes, it, it's um, actually it's an interesting. Uh, I'll make this as brief as I can. But if you actually take clinical laboratory tests, uh, you look at the literature. The, the estimate is that they represent about two percent of our healthcare costs. But that's just the test itself. The tests, if you do excess tests, one or two of them just are going to turn out abnormal, and they may be abnormal because something happened in the testing process. But it launches the individual patient on a series of additional studies because we're not sure what's going on, so we have to do it. So there's an added cost. Um, so because I'm a pathologist, the clinical laboratory is where I'm starting my focus. Um, but if I could get all physicians to quit ordering all tests, I wouldn't have much of an impact. And I understand that. But what I want to do is gain their confidence as I talk to them about laboratory tests to let's talk about other tests and the big tests that are radiology type tests or biopsy tests. Um, and that's where a lot of healthcare costs are. In my very preliminary studies and talking to colleagues, there are, for example, a, a test called CBC, or complete blood count, it measures how many blood cells you have. You really only need one when you get admitted to the hospital, maybe two, depending on what's going on. But there's some people who order it every day, and that's a significant number order every day. And for different reasons, I'm trying to understand those reasons. It's that kind of thing I'm trying to get at. I want to talk to my colleagues, and let's work together. I don't want administrators, insurance companies, everybody gets upset when somebody else talks about it and then we hunker down and we don't talk. But maybe I can help with the conversation. Well, that's certain, certain welcome, I'm sure, in the profession to save our costs and to help. Uh, we'd like to thank you very much, Dr. Heinz, for coming here. Now, as I told all of you before, we don't pay him any money. <laughs> but we know how busy people are in today's world. 
So we would like to save him some time, which is the equivalent of money in today's world, and give him a coffee cup that he can sit in his car and drink his morning coffee while he's driving to work. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Oh, thank, thank you. you thank you. I've got a question. Okay. Would you agree that uh, if you've had a 